Now, Satu is calling on the president to sign the copyright amendment bill. This as uh, the country celebrates the 2019 metric pass rate improvement and the president leads the reading revolution campaign. Now, Satu believes there should be the legal framework to promote access to educational material for the benefit of learners, teachers and academics without any apartheid or multinational publishing company restrictions. The union believes that the problem with the current copyright bill that came into law in the 19th 1970s. Just to expand a little bit on this discussion, I'm joined now by Stephen Hollis, intellectual property lawyer and partner at Adams and Adams, and Golani Fakute, Satu uh, Secretariat Officer. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Thank good you morning, so much uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, let me start with you, Golani. You're calling for the president to sign the copyright amendment bill, and you've already listed um, uh, several factors. Just uh, uh, speak us through some of the imperative matters when it comes to the urgency of this matter. Well, first, let me greet you, Paul. Let me greet uh, Stephen as well and, um, and uh, your viewers. Satu is indeed calling, if quite emphatically so, I must say, uh, by the way, and it's not for the first time that we're making this call, for the president to sign the copyright amendment bill uh, into law as a matter of agency. It has been uh, on his uh, table for, what, about uh, eight or so months now, uh, close to a year, uh, as a matter of fact. But now what concerns Satu is that from an educational point of view, we are saying that you cannot have a framework that was drafted in the, in the 1970s uh, still being in place right now. Our problem primarily with that important is that firstly, uh, when we talk the trending language these days, uh, the, the so-called 4IR, uh, I mean right now we are busy putting Wi-Fi in schools, uh, etc., so that we can promote that kind of access. But now it, 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 it then becomes pointless when you've got a, a you, you'll be promoting access to some of these tools, uh, such as uh, putting the Wi-Fi in schools, etc., but then now in terms of access to educational material, for instance, it still remains extremely, extremely restricted. Now, some, of course, will say there is a counter uh, lobby, by the way, I must say, in, to our position mm -hmm. uh, as such. Some will say, yeah, but then you are going to affect uh, the work of the, of the publishers, uh, the authors, etc., etc. And we are saying that any bill in poor must be developmental in nature. It cannot just be an obsession about protecting the rights of the individual uh, in this case. And we are saying that the bill, as much as yes, we want to do that, I fully agree. I mean, I'm from a labor union. I'm the one who would know the most that, indeed, you need to be paid for work. But the fact of the matter is that there must be a developmental kind of a concern that we have. Now, what we are seeing, lastly, is that in South Africa, we always say that our budget, education budget, Part of it, most of it, other than human resources, we spend on learning and teaching support material, a significant amount of it. And we are saying that the current uh, 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 laws as they are, they do not necessarily promote even access. Uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, Stephen is a technical person. He will come uh, over here into the picture. But what, the, what it does, basically, is that it does not even, even promote access for, for, for even other smaller publishers who might want even to come into the picture. For instance, in South Africa, most of the LTSM uh, budget goes to no more than four uh, publishing companies, uh, by the so we are saying as that from a developmental point of view, as the president leads the reading revolution campaign, we are saying, Mr. President, yes, we want to read. We want to be a reading nation as the, as the, as, as Satur as well. But we are saying that let's then have the laws that will make that. Now, lastly, there is no bill that has ever been perfect. I've never seen it. Yeah. Because there will always be groups uh, and other interested parties who will want to have a counter view. But we are saying then you firm that, that up through the regulatory mechanisms of the very bill that well, you then, then have in let's, place. Let's just bring Stephen in about. here. Um, Stephen, just from a legal perspective, just uh, uh, looking at the bill in its current form and the differences that uh, the new bill will have, the new law will have on, on um, factors like education, like the creatives in the country, what are those uh, differences? Well, I think what needs to be recognized, first of all, is that this bill doesn't only impact upon the educational sector, it also impacts on, on all of our creative sectors. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a bill that one can, uh, yes, Satu's uh, a call for the bill to simply be signed into law because uh, they do want these changes of more access to materials uh, to materialize. But in the educational space itself, before we even look at the broader other creative sectors uh, affected negatively by the bill, should the bill be enacted, the problem is that you, with copyright law, there has to be a clear balance between the rights of the, the authors and the creatives mm -hmm. and the rights holders and the rights of users to access the materials under certain conditions. So once that balance is actually disturbed, and uh, from a legal perspective, I believe that the bill does exactly that. Uh, as a matter of fact, the only economic impact assessment study that was done uh, by PwC 
uh, on the bill that was presented by the Publishers Association to Parliament's uh, Portfolio Committee on Trade and Industry during the August 2017 parliamentary debates on the bill showed that there's massive uh, uh, potential for job losses and, uh, you know, in the publishing space due to these changes. Now, one of the big changes in the educational space is a, a proposal that government should be able to freely copy and distribute textbooks in the educational space uh, if they disagree with the price of the textbooks. And high-ranking uh, government uh, officials have, during the, the legislative process, when asked about the introduction of these overly broad copyright exceptions that affect not only the educational space, but in fact all of our creative sectors. And you might have heard the buzzword of fair use. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, but we have, they have fair use in America, so why can't we have it here? As a matter of fact, what's imported in South Africa is just the fair use principle. Not, none of the balancing of uh, counterweights in America, like statutory damages, that will keep users in check. So what you can, the fear is in South Africa that this bill would lead to uh, rampant copying and distribution of, of copyright uh, protected materials, especially in the educational space, mm -hmm. where the bill actually states and says government and educational institutions can copy, can distribute, can, and can access, can adapt, can cut and paste um, educational texts into their course packs and make it available for learners. Now, we do recognize there's a problem with education, but is it so that the authors of textbooks in South Africa must bear the brunt of having their uh, money that they earn from their, from their work uh, cut, uh, uh, you know, to actually fix a government problem insofar as the, and a government fault insofar as the distribution of text, uh, educational materials uh, uh, and also the reduction of cost is concerned. And uh, I think one needs to be also aware of the, the international implications of this. Uh, as you would be aware, South Africa is currently uh, on the brink of a, of a review of our GSP uh, and AGOA uh, benefit el eligibility by the Office of the United States uh, Trade Representative. This after a complaint was brought by the International Intellectual Property Alliance, the IPA, which is a, a group representing the interests of American businesses that want to do business in South Africa. And what they're saying is that if this bill is enacted as it is pre presently worded, it would actually reduce our copyright legislation or our copyright protection for locals and for internationals to an all-time low. And this would lead to a trade barrier where they would not feel comfortable investing in this, in this jurisdiction. So the bill, the discussion around the bill is much broader than just the educational uh, aspects and the developmental aspects. And I agree the developmental aspects is critically important. But personally, I believe that government uh, is missing the point if they're trying to say that by cutting the, uh, by not having to pay authors for their textbooks, mm -hmm. and think about it in South Africa, more than 70% of authors that earn from their work write educational texts. Me, if I was an educational writer of, of, of educational texts, yeah. if my book was just distributed uh, uh, without, without remuneration, uh, if I would actually stop writing and I would go maybe overseas and start writing books there. And then when the current syllabus is, is uh, out of date, uh, uh, where would the next books come from if yeah. we've actually killed off a whole generation? Stephen, I just right. want to get some reaction from yes. Kolani. Kolani, <clears throat> just listening to that and uh, um, you know, now learning that it's, it, it's uh, more than just uh, signing on the dotted lines. There are many considerations to make, not just for the education system, mm. but uh, for creatives in the country. What is your response? Yes, of course. Firstly, before I even get back to that, I think I, think I, must, I, must, I must just make this categorically categorical clear. Yes. Our view is such that actually the problem is not even the authors, by the way, it's the public publishing companies. That is where the problem is. That is why, in actual fact, I was even t uh, explaining to Stephen before we came on studio here, that I went to the, to the World Intellectual Property Organization just recently. I was there and we were discussing a number of uh, part of these issues and I can assure you that in as far as we are concerned, that even the, the, the Copyright Amendment Bill, as it is proposed right now, it even aligns itself to some of the conventions that WIPO has. Uh, such as, uh, such as uh, the Ben Convention, for instance. And that comes through the flexibilities uh, part of it, the fair use uh, doctrine part of it. Now, we are saying, Paul, that the USA itself, for the past, for the past uh, decade, by the way, the lobby group that Stephen is talking about mm -hmm. is, uh, by the way, a, a, a lobby group led by USA um, a, a, a publishing companies mm -hmm. uh, that now have got their, their proxy companies in South Africa. And now, what we are saying is that, is that you, you, you've got a country that, in, in its own, has been using 
the, the, the very same flexibilities, fair use uh, uh, doctrine, that we want to develop their own nation from an educational point of view, from a research material point of view, uh, point of view yet they do not want other countries to do that. When I was there in Waipo, Mpo, almost the entire global south, developmental south, was complaining only about one particular country. That, by the way, is going all over, having this counter lobby group. So what we're saying, Stephen, is that by all means, this bill, by the way, I think it is a slight misrepresentation, because Stephen is trying to give an impression that the amendment bill, as it is right now, will completely completely annihilate that the author. We do not think so. In actual fact, we think the opposite. We think that it can create even more opportunities so that you do not have just a mafia of publishing companies that are sitting here mm -hmm. getting the lion's share of the budget in terms of the learning and teaching support material. And that is what we're saying. So we are still calling for the president to sign the bill. And we are saying, Stephen, that there is no bill that is perfect. The regulatory space after the bill is enacted, that is therefore where we should continue this particular conversation. And by the way, it is not just, indeed I agree with you, a case of signing. There was a process, a years long, not just one year, I'm talking about almost six to seven years mm -hmm. of a process whereby when we started uh, with this particular process with the, with the lead department, in the Department of Trade and Industry. So it, it therefore does not mean that a, a, a government just sat somewhere, they just decided to write a bill and send it to the president for him to sign. It does not work like that at all. In actual fact, there were consultations with multiple groups, etc. I think the only problem here, but this is what such things, yeah. is that the publishing company started panicking when now the bill had gone through all the entire parliamentary processes, which is a consultative process on its own. It's a democratic process. South Africa is a democratic parliamentary country. Mm -hmm. and, and they started panicking when then the bill is, uh, is, is with the president and I think to themselves, oh my, now this now starts cutting on our, on, on our uh, profit maximization agenda, which is primarily what they want. So we are saying that let the president uh, uh, sign the bill into law. Then from there, the regulatory space, the lawyer, the lawyer Stephen, them will then come and advise us on the technicalities. But mm -hmm. this amendment bill, as it is, it is aligned to the best, uh, to the conventions like the Ben Convention which I'll keep on uh, mentioning. That is the international standard. So why can't developing countries uh, do it, yet the U.S. can do it? Stephen, um, just uh, weighing in here, you spoke about the wording that uh, in its current form, uh, this bill cannot uh, be affected. But uh, what are some of the solutions then to making uh, some sort of leeway around this and allowing the um, gaps in the space for young creatives to come on board and also benefit without disadvantaging, uh, disadvantaging those who have already publish their work? Well, before we get there, there's just a key point that I need to address uh, in response. The, what this bill does that's really problematic and that's, that has investors in our creative sectors locally and internationally up in arms. Let's remember the IIPA complaint uh, is not just publishers, it's people involved in the movie business, it's a motion picture association who wants to make films here. Uh, it's actually the, 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 the music companies that want to produce more content here. It's companies that are interested in doing business in South Africa, but they feel that they're going to lose a legitimate market, like our writers, like our authors in the educational space, fear that they're going to lose a legitimate market when writing educational texts for educational institutions in South Africa and for government. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, this concern is not just some... Of, of publishing companies, evil publishing companies somewhere in America that's cooking this up. The IIPA complaint, if you go and read it, they don't compa complain about fair use at all. They used to fair use in the United States. But you know, like I mentioned just a moment ago, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of deception in the process that has actually managed, I think, to even confuse uh, people in our government uh, by persons who, uh, who lobby for fair use on behalf of the companies in the United States that make the most profit from using copyright protected material by not paying for it. We're talking about the big digital companies, the big yeah, tech Stephen, companies. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just to um, wrap things up, uh, just looking at the solutions. I mean, uh, the problems are, are here, yes, but uh, try, trying to find a way around it that will ensure that uh, this as, um, is, is not uh, just uh, um, one-sided, but uh, developmental in a, a rounded uh, uh, sort of uh, angle. Mm. I think what, uh, you know, the best result that we can hope for mm -hmm. uh, is for the bill to be sent back for substantial uh, additional work to be done. Uh, and in that process, not only for one government department to look at the bill, but let's establish an interministerial committee, uh, uh, as was recommended in the CRC report of 2011, which led to some of the copyright reform. Let's involve the Department of Education in the discussion. Mm -hmm. Let's involve the Department of Science and, and Technology, the Department of Communication, and have a broader representative, not only uh, engagement with the different industry sectors to see you know, how we can actually, in the quickest time possible, uh, amend the legislation to a level that will not only uh, invite 
of uh, more investment into our creative sectors, but improve the plight of our, creative, uh, our creatives themselves and give them increased protections while giving balanced rights of access to, uh, to the users. So um, I think a, a broader perspective is required of when the bill is, re is being reworked. Mm, okay. Uh, I know this is a burning topic, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave it here. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time and